I had an interesting encounter a few years ago. It's one of those things where you aren't entirely sure what you saw, but you have a good idea, and it keeps you up at night. I had been working as a park ranger in the Rocky Mountains. I was very passionate about the Rocky Mountains ecosystem. We had seen a ton of forest fires around this time, and it had been very dry for several years. So once a fire started, it just spread and spread. Many trees had been wiped out in recent years, and the landscape was completely charred. It had been for quite some time. It was my duty to watch over one particular area and to keep it safe. It felt like quite the reward after something so devastating had happened. I really enjoyed taking care of my area of the park. I felt like I was nursing it back to health even though I didn't have much to do with it. It was all just Mother Nature. But I was still proud. I was definitely spending a great deal of time there and I felt like I lived in the park. I know people say you can never recognize anything in a forest, but I can say confidently that I knew my way around that forest. Maybe because some of the trees were missing, but I don't think I could have gotten lost out there. Not in my area, anyway. Because of the fires, we didn't have visitors too often, but I like to check out our progress for rehabilitation. I remember one day in August, it was very warm out. I felt like it could have been a day in July. The sun was really pounding down on my head, so I grabbed a hat. To be honest, I hated wearing hats because I didn't feel like I could be in full awareness of my surroundings. The hat felt like it restricted my sight and my hearing for some reason. So, I do regret wearing it that day. But I didn't think I was going to be put into the situation that I found myself in. I remember driving around a bend and I wanted to get out and look around get some nice fresh air and see what things I could find growing. What I was hoping was to find some fungi. When you find fungi after a fire, it's really beautiful. The mushrooms eat away all the dead tree matter from the fire, and their warm colors just look so vibrant against the burnt black mess. There's nothing like it. It's amazing and you get a new appreciation for the things that nature can do on its own. Anyway, I ended up finding patches of some pyrophilus fungi in different areas. That meant that the forest was healing itself, so I kept moving on. As I'm looking around then, I hear some knocking noises coming from a bit north of my location. It sounded like something knocking against wood, like wood against wood. It was a hollow sound, almost. At first I didn't really mind it, but then I heard another knock. Wildlife in this particular area would not intentionally knock on something multiple times. That was a habit common in primates. And there are no known primates in the Rockies. So I was confused. And then I heard it again. I started wondering if someone else was in the forest with me. Like, maybe mocking me, wanting me to be scared. But that didn't make any sense. I stood as quietly as I could wanted to be able to hear if something was heading in my direction. But I didn't hear footsteps, but I could definitely hear branches breaking in the distance. I couldn't tell what was making the noises, and I couldn't even really tell which direction it was coming from at that point. I just stayed still, and I tried to prevent doing anything to draw attention to myself. And that's when I saw a rock fly past my head. Something was now throwing rocks at me. I looked around, and instantly, my heart sank into my stomach. About a dozen yards away was a huge, towering mass. It was dark, and it appeared to be covered in dark brown fur. I could have mistaken it for a bear, but I knew it wasn't. Its arms were much longer and thinner than a bear's, and so were its legs. Its shoulders were massive, and then the thing stood straight up. It was bipedal. It seemed completely natural for it to stand that way, and it looked very much like a humanoid. It was frightening as heck. I wasn't prepared for this at all, and before I knew it, the creature disappeared into the charred landscape, like a chameleon blending into its surroundings. It had a perfect color to camouflage into the burnt remains of the forest. I watched it leave as it walked off into the distance. From that point on, any time I went to the park, I kept my eyes peeled, wanting to be sure of that encounter. I wanted to see it for a second time. But despite my best efforts, I never did see that thing again. 
I have a close friend that works as a park ranger there too, and occasionally I'll ask if they had ever had any encounters or seen any strange creatures in the forest. But they always reply, I guess I'm not as lucky as you. And I can feel that there's a bit of sarcasm there. But in a way, I do feel lucky. Don't get me wrong, what happened was frightening, but it was also very magical. It was something that really made me see life in a new way. I have a better appreciation of life and all of its secrets now. If things like what I witnessed were seen all the time, they would lose their luster a bit. It's like the first time you see mushrooms growing out of dead, burnt debris. It's amazing, and I'll treasure it. First off, I want to let you know that I'm a big fan and I've been watching your content for a while now. I've always been interested in the supernatural and encrypted hunting. There's way more out there than the government or mainstream media wants you to know. I think my affinity for these stories began when I saw my first cryptid back in 1973. I was only 11 years old, but that day has stuck with me for my entire life. The image of the creature was burned into my mind, and I became mildly obsessed with trying to see it again. Well, now it's nearly 50 years later, and yesterday, I came into contact with this beast once again. I was born and raised in Albany, New York, and I've always been curious about nature and animals. I spent a great deal of time exploring the Albany Pine Bush Preserve. We're situated right between the Catskills and the Adirondacks, and there are tons of trails throughout the area. I'm going to start with my first interaction with the creature way back when, and then tell you all about what went down yesterday. It was the 1970s, so things were a bit more wild and free. I would spend most of my days running around with friends and my brother in the city and the surrounding suburbs. Some summers we would stay over at my aunt's house, which was just down the road from Pine Bush. The summers were amazingly fun and we felt like we had a whole preserve to ourselves. After what we encountered, I knew that wasn't true. The most interesting part of the preserve are the sand dunes. And now we are right smack dab in the middle of upstate New York. You don't expect the soil to look like a beach. The barren sands are often going up in smoke since they're so dry and desolate. But there's a great deal of critters living in these woods, even on the dunes. So I went out exploring one day by myself because my brother was at horse camp or something. I was walking through the sandy terrain when I saw a dog on the top of a dune. I tried calling over to it, thinking it had gotten lost or away from its owner. It didn't move when I called, so I started towards it. From a distance, it looked like any old dog, maybe a greyhound or a rottweiler, or a massive chihuahua. It was skinny, and I could see the shadows of its ribcage sticking out from under its skin. It was blackish-brown with tall legs and a long snout. And as I walked towards it, it began to growl at me. I started to see it clearer now, and it had a scaly reptilian skin, and it was definitely not a dog. I was a scared little kid at the time, so I backed away slowly. Well, actually, I think any sane person would have done the same. And then the thing started to move towards me, and it moved low to the ground, and it stuck out this long pink tongue. It turned to run. I never looked back. I don't think it ended up chasing me, and I never saw it again. And like I said, this day stuck in my mind for the rest of my life. I told my friends and my family about what I'd seen. Nobody believed me. They thought I was making the story up for attention. I never went walking in the woods after that, but for the rest of my life, I stayed curious. And all those years, it wasn't until just yesterday that I saw it again. I was driving past the preserve on my way to make some deliveries, I work as a postman these days, and I take a few routes that take me out into the more desolate parts of the county. I was going about 65 when I spotted it, but I slowed down right away. There was a dead deer carcass on the side of the road. It had been there for at least a day. I'd seen it as I passed by the day before. It was bloated and very clearly a buck, decently sized with a pair of half-grown antlers. The creature that I saw was ripping at it, and it was barely recognizable as a deer at this point. It sunk its teeth in and it used its long tongue to lap at the coagulated blood. 
It was disgusting. I looked at it in my rearview mirror and I just could not believe it. I started to put my truck into reverse so I could get a closer look. I pulled back slowly, but the thing did not pay any attention that I was getting closer. My windows were open, the smell of rotting flesh and sewage wafted into the truck. I tried to hold my breath, but it was just a horrible smell that started to make my eyes water. It was so bad. I closed them for a moment to try to push out the tears, and when I opened them again, the creature was approaching my car. I sat there for a moment, and I stared at it. It walked right towards my truck's door and sat just about six feet away. Now I got a really good look at the thing, and I didn't even have a chance to notice the smell because my heart was racing so fast. This thing was hideous and drooling. Its entire face and neck and chest were covered in the blood and guts of the deer. Its ears flicked back and forth, and its back arched like it was going to pounce. Once I saw that, I knew I had to get out of there. I stepped on the gas, and it started actually chasing after me. I thought maybe I could lead it into town or towards the ranger station so someone could get a photo or shoot it. I kept starting and stopping, going at about 30 miles an hour, and the thing was keeping right up with me. Eventually, another car started to come towards me, and I flashed my brights to signal them. Once the thing heard the engine of that car, it ducked back into the brush, and it was gone, and I don't think that car even got a look at it. Probably didn't even know what was going on. I hope maybe they did, though, so at least someone else will know what I'm talking about. My family is pissed that I'm back at it again with this thing, but I hope you guys will appreciate the story. Let me know what you think. Before I even saw it, I could sense that something was wrong. It was a warm, sunny day, and I had just gotten off work at the local supermarket. At the time, I lived near the city of Corvallis, Oregon, which is about an hour east of the Oregon coast. I had recently purchased a used car that I was totally excited about. I got in the car and started driving down the road towards home, but then decided I wanted to keep driving around in it for a bit. So it was about 2.30 in the afternoon when I decided to turn onto a dirt road that led towards the woods. I knew the road well and had driven on it periodically when I didn't want to head straight home. So I drove about a mile down this road until I realized that it was stupid to have brought my new-to-me car on this dirt road, so I looked for somewhere to stop and turn around. And that's when I came to an old logging trail that went off to the right. There was still plenty of daylight left, so I changed my mind about leaving and decided to just park and walk a bit on the trail to see where it went. I followed the trail for about a quarter mile or so when... All of a sudden, everything seemed unnaturally strange and quiet. I even stopped walking when I noticed how quiet it had become. No birds were chirping, no squirrels were running up and down the trees. Nothing at all was happening. It was dead silent. So that's when I started to get this uneasy feeling inside my gut like something was about to happen. So I decided to turn around and just head back to the car, which was still visible from where I stood, even though it was a way off in the distance. But as soon as I turned to walk back to the car, that's when I saw it. A flicker of movement off to the side. I squinted in the sunlight and looked into the trees, and there, about 20 feet away from me, standing behind a tree, was this creature with its cheek pressed against the tree trunk, looking straight at me. At first, I didn't know what the hell it was, but after staring at it for about 10 seconds or so, trying to figure it out, it dawned on me that this thing looked exactly like a Sasquatch. My first thought after realizing what it looked like was, holy shit. My heart immediately began racing, and I felt like I was going to pass out. After realizing what it was, I immediately turned around and started running back to my car as fast as I could. When I looked back over my shoulder, I was horrified to see that it was chasing me down the trail. It ran faster than anything I've ever seen. This thing moved so fast that in a matter of 10 seconds or so, it had covered the same distance that took me 30 seconds to cover. I ran as fast as I could until I reached my car, and I can only assume that it didn't actually want to catch me, or it easily would have. In fact, it was no longer in sight at this point. 
So once inside my car, I locked all the doors. I sat there for a few minutes trying to catch my breath and calm down from the experience. At least I felt much safer locked in the car. And then after about five minutes, when I finally got the courage to start the car and drive off, this creature came running out of the woods right next to where my car was parked and stopped dead in its tracks. And then it looked at me through the windshield. It stood there blocking my way for several seconds, just staring at me with its mouth wide open like it wanted to say something but couldn't speak. It looked exactly like how a gorilla looks when they have their mouths wide open, except this thing had extremely long white teeth. And it also had long black hair all over its body, including its face, which made it hard for me to tell the exact shape of its head. The hair on its head was long and stringy looking. It also had a very pronounced brow ridge that made it look even more intimidating. Its shoulders were broad and it had a very muscular body. I'm not sure how tall it was, but I would guess around seven or eight feet tall based on the size of its body compared to the trees around it. So after staring at me for several seconds, it just turned around and ran back into the woods, where I can only assume it lived. So after seeing this creature up close, there is no doubt in my mind whatsoever that the things people have been reporting on your website, Lilith, are indeed real. I've come to have no doubt whatsoever that this thing I saw was a genuine Bigfoot. After seeing it for myself, there's no way I could even convince myself otherwise. I mean, I've seen plenty of bears, wolves, and other animals native to the area, but none of them looked anything like this. I'm not sure if you believe me or not, but there's nothing anybody can say to make me think otherwise. This creature was real, and it was right here in my own town, which totally sucks. I'm not going to give out my real name because I don't want any trouble, but I will tell you that I'm very credible, and this is 100% the truth. I know it sounds crazy. But it is the truth. I'd be more than willing to even take a lie detector test for somebody or whatever else they would need to prove what I saw was real. But I guess that really can't happen until I feel okay enough to share my name. Thanks for listening. Most people don't think of the hills when they think of Texas. I don't know why that is. When I think of Texas, the first thing I think of is the hills. Maybe that's because I grew up there. Until I was about 20 years old, the hills were all I knew. My family tended a goat ranch for a few generations. We would still be there, I think, if it wasn't for what happened to me. If it wasn't for what I saw. It was my last summer there. I was 20. And for the first time in my life, my father wasn't working alongside me. So his responsibilities fell to me. Soon, I was feeding, cleaning, and herding all of the livestock myself. But I forgot something very important. My father had rules for the ranch. Goats had to be in certain places at certain times. And those rules were even more strict during the summer. Whenever I asked why, he explained it away as lessons he had inherited from his grandfather. I guess those rules didn't stick with me so good. The summer got hot and I got tired. I got a little lax with my duties. Before I knew it, some of the goats had split from the ranch. They had run loose into the hills looking for who knows what. It's hard to read a goat's mind. So it came down to me, of course, to chase them. I tracked most of them down pretty quickly, too, but one was a little more hard-headed than the rest. I didn't get my sights on him until the sun was going down, I didn't know it at the time, but I was already too late. Something got to the goat before me. It was just a blur at first. It was a gray streak against the rolling browns and yellows of the terrain. The blur passed by me, and before I knew what was happening, my goat was gone. I didn't know what I was seeing, so I kept approaching the area where I saw that mysterious shape collide with my animal. There were tracks in the dirt. There were signs of a struggle, but not a lot, so it was obvious that the struggle ended quickly. And then there were drag marks leading away from the site. How could it have snatched the goat off of its feet and dragged it away without me seeing? Without even slowing down? It didn't make any sense. In my mind, the thought of something moving that fast and colliding with an animal? I would have expected a bit of carnage. 
but there wasn't a drop of blood on the ground. I continued looking around, only to hear this strange clicking in the distance. Something was chattering its teeth. I looked in that direction, but with the light fading, I couldn't make it out. It was too far away, but I could tell that whatever it was, it was watching me, warning me somehow. Maybe it was telling me that the game was about to begin. I knew I needed to get back. I needed to get out of those hills before I disappeared too. Whatever I was dealing with, I was confident that it could carry me away as cleanly as it had my goat. I'd come up on an ATV, but I had left it a while back so I wouldn't scare the goat as I closed in. But it was still nearby. I just had to get to it. Unfortunately for me, the thing knew exactly where I was headed. So just when I turned to run, the blur came back and it streaked out in front of me and skidded to a sudden halt. It moved faster than any animal I had ever seen. And then what was glaring at me was something almost indescribable. It was gray-skinned and almost scaly, but in the shape of a large dog. Its tail looked barbed, and its eyes were wide and bulging, almost like a toad's. I didn't want to find out if it could jump like one, too. Fortunately for me, one of the rules of the ranch that I did follow was to remain armed at all times. I had never seen a creature like the one in front of me, but I had seen my share of wily predators. I held my breath and fired a bullet into the air, hoping it would be enough to scare the monster away. I got lucky. It was. I saw those bulging eyes go wide, staring at the gun as if it recognized the weapon. And then it dashed away. Maybe to escape. Maybe to regroup. I didn't stick around to find out. I sprinted for my own getaway. I started that ATV and tore out of there. I was embarrassed at first, but eventually I did tell my father. How else would I explain that we had lost one of our own? He seemed relieved. I guess he was more thankful that I had gotten away than he was upset at my laziness. I honestly expected him to chew me out. Instead, he agreed when I suggested that it might be time for me to move on from the ranch. Truth was, I didn't want to go back out there. If he had known about that creature all this time and still wanted to tend our animals, well, that was his decision. But it wasn't mine. So, I headed off to the city for work. But now, recently, my father has passed away. All I can think about are those hills. Part of them are mine too, I suppose. The land we worked on, the animals we tended to, and the house we grew up in. They all fall to me now. I don't really want to say goodbye to that place, at least not permanently. But how do I go back there and feel safe after seeing what I did? Is it just a matter of obeying the old rules that he taught me? Or would it be wiser for me to stay far away from that home? Stay away. Stay in the city. When I was about 16, I went to a party with a few friends. I didn't really care for high school parties, but my friends ended up dragging me along, despite knowing I didn't want to go. It was a typical high school party. My friends went about mingling and flirting with other partygoers while I found a comfy spot on the living room couch. I was bored out of my mind, quite honestly, and about to ditch my friends when a few girls came into the living room, giggling with a game board. They were conversing amongst themselves, saying they had to try this game. They didn't seem to notice me, and I didn't care at all. I was just sort of enjoying watching and sitting in the background. Eventually, they got started, and I was standing to leave when one of them called me over, saying, Hey, we need a fourth person. Come play with us. I reluctantly figured that whatever it was would be better than moping around, so I agreed. I sat down by them and they opened the game board. Only, it wasn't a game. I recognized the board, but I had never used one myself. The word Ouija was at the top of the board and the letters of the alphabet were scattered across. I was intrigued right away as they explained how it worked. If only I could have forecasted the events that would transpire soon. One girl instructed each of us to place our hands on a wooden piece that had a clear lens at the top and then another girl asked loudly if there were any spirits that would like to communicate with us. 
Instantly, the wooden piece slid up to yes. I hadn't moved it, but I was totally convinced that one of them had. I chuckled to myself, thinking, okay, they're just trying to mess with me. Then it was my turn to ask a question, but I wasn't sure what to ask. And then I thought, let me just ask the name of who we were conversing with. I asked, and the wooden piece instantly shifted around the board, and it stopped momentarily on letters, eventually spelling out the name Benjamin. Immediately, one of the girls pulled away and blurted out, No! No way! Who made that move? We all looked around, denying it, and asked her what had happened. Why was she so freaked out? She was clearly shaken up, but eventually calmed down enough to tell us that that was the name of her older brother, who had passed away a few years ago. At that point, I could tell she wanted to ask more questions to see if it really was her brother. So she thought up a question that only she knew the answer to at the party. We all placed our hands back on the piece, and then she said, How did you die? The piece shifted around slowly and spelled out, Car wreck. Her face practically went white when those two words were spelled out, which told me that it was correct. I was starting to think that this was not fake and that we had, in fact, made contact with her brother. None of us were pressing on, asking any more questions, and she was clearly shaken up. I could tell she was trying her best to suppress emotions, but couldn't hold it in much longer. She started crying. I felt bad. I offered to go get tissues and some water. Having been secluded in the living room, I almost even forgot that there was a whole party going on. So I made my way through the crowd, and I found a walk-in pantry. I found tissues on a top shelf, and as I reached up for them, the door closed behind me, and the lights turned off. I gasped, and I was fumbling for the light switch frantically. I switched it back on and sighed, resting my head forwards on the wall. I then turned back around, and right there, I was met face to face with a boy about 18 years old wearing a football jersey. I jumped backwards. You scared me, I yelled. He apologized for the prank. He said he was already in there when I walked in, and he's the one who had turned the lights off. He then asked if I came to these parties often because he had never seen me before. I told him I was dragged into coming, but I never had a desire to be a partygoer. He seemed nice, and he sort of wanted to chat longer, but I also decided that I needed to get back to comfort the girl. Before I turned to walk away, he said, Tell Mitchie I'm okay. I cocked my head to the side, thinking he must have mistaken me for somebody else. And then I returned to the group of girls and gave them water and tissues. I asked the girl a few questions, like how old her brother was and what he looked like. She said he was really into sports and especially loved football. She went on about their childhood growing up and all the memories they had had together. In the moment, she seemed to really be connecting with me. And so she pulled out her phone and showed me a couple pictures of them. One in particular before a football game. I instantly froze. Her brother was the guy I ran into in the pantry. I stood up, shaking and confused. What kind of sick prank is this? I yelled. The other girls looked at me puzzled. I was mad. But then, I don't know what came over me. It was like I lost control of my body. I could feel it happening to me, and then I said, Mitchie, I'm okay now. I mean, it was my body, but I wasn't in my body. I was mouthing the words, but it wasn't my voice. A few seconds later, I snapped out of it, and I blurted out that I had just seen her brother in the pantry. We all then looked at each other. We knew exactly what had happened, but none of us said anything about it out loud. This happened about 10 years ago, and that group of girls and I are still very close friends to this day. Granted, we haven't touched a Ouija board since, but I believe that my friend got some closure and was able to move on in a way that she hadn't been able to before. Whether it was all real or not, at least she can now feel better. This second story involves a police officer who saw something that no one should ever have to see. It happened in the town of St. Augustine, Florida in 1972. One night I was working the midnight shift, I was dispatched to a call of a possible prowler at an old abandoned house near the beach. The dispatcher said that supposedly no one had lived in the house for years and that it was thought by locals to be haunted. 
Well, I arrived at the location, looked around for a while, but found no sign of anyone. Thinking I might have been called to the area for nothing, I decided to cruise around town for a while, just checking it out, before returning to the station. As I drove by what we called the sand dunes, something caught my eye in the middle of the road ahead. It looked like a pile of rags or clothes in the middle of the road, so I slowed down as I approached it so that I could avoid hitting it. Then suddenly, this thing stood up on two legs, and it stood there looking at me with glowing red eyes. It was about five feet nine inches tall and very thin with long arms that hung way past its knees. It stood there and watched me as I drove past at about 35 miles an hour. And when I reached the next intersection, I turned around and headed back towards it just to see what was going on. But as I approached the area again, it was gone. But there was no place for it to go, to hide. This thing seemed to literally disappear into thin air. I drove up and down the streets in that area for a while looking for it, but I never found any further traces. And then the following day, another officer and I returned to the abandoned house on the beach where the original call had come from. We walked around the house looking for any signs of a prowler or anything unusual when we heard something approaching in the sand behind us. We both turned around at exactly the same time to see this thing standing there watching us, the thing with glowing red eyes. It was about 20 feet away. It stood there watching us for about 30 seconds before suddenly taking two giant steps towards us before stopping. And then it took another two steps. And then it stopped again. And it continued this slow, deliberate movement towards us for another 30 seconds before suddenly taking off in this amazing burst of speed. I mean, it literally disappeared into thin air as it ran off into the distance. We both stood there in total amazement at what we had just seen. There was no doubt in my mind that it was exactly the same creature I had seen the night before. After talking to several people who lived in the area, I learned that this house on the beach where we had the encounter was known by many to be haunted, and no one ever wanted to enter the house or check out any of the strange noises purported to come from inside. So, with nothing to go on but our word of mouth, the case was dropped. And then several years later, a local TV station did a special on this house and its supposed haunting. They brought in an expert who used electronic equipment to try and pick up any unusual activity or spirits inside the house. He captured some very strange sounds on his equipment, but when he played them back, skeptics claimed that they were just birds or other natural ocean noises picked up by the equipment. I've always wondered if what we saw that night was a ghost or something else. Whatever it was, it was definitely not of this world. It had glowing red eyes and could basically disappear into thin air. I mean, it moved so slowly towards us that we did have plenty of time to observe it, and we know what we saw. The only thing I can think of is that maybe it was some type of a primate or hominid that lived in Florida thousands of years ago before modern man arrived here. But whatever it was, I know for sure that it wasn't human. I often wonder if there are more like it out there. Have any of you seen anything similar? My life completely changed and essentially all came crashing down the year I went camping for a few days in Yosemite. It was late May of 2008, and I was feeling depressed. I had just broken up with my girlfriend and basically felt like I was at the end of my ropes. So I decided to go on a road trip from San Francisco all the way to Yosemite, which was essentially a 200-mile drive straight east. If you've never been there, Yosemite is quite literally in the middle of nowhere. There are no cities within miles of it, and basically only one main road that leads into and out of it. I arrived around noon on a Saturday and immediately set up camp in the Upper Pines campground. I had all of the stuff I needed and I was ready to relax for the next two days before going back home on Monday. The campground was pretty empty when I arrived. Maybe about 10 to 15 other campsites were occupied. I started a small fire and I began cooking lunch when I noticed a young couple setting up a tent about 50 yards from me. As I ate my food, an older couple with two dogs arrived and set up camp right next to me. They seemed nice enough, so we exchanged pleasantries as they unpacked their stuff. 
After they finished, I watched as they walked over to the trail to start hiking. I finished eating and decided to take a walk myself. I walked along the trail for about 10 minutes, taking in the sights when I saw something odd off in the distance. It looked like something standing on top of one of the rock formations that jutted out from the ground. At first, I thought it was just an optical illusion because it was so far away and in a place that would be nearly impossible to get to. But as I continued to look at it, it seemed to be moving closer. It also looked like whatever it was stood on two legs instead of four like a normal animal would. Whatever this thing was disappeared behind another rock formation, and then reappeared again, and then disappeared completely. This made me incredibly curious, and so I decided to speed up my pace towards it. I got closer in about 10 minutes and looked towards where it had been, but saw nothing. It was at this point that I realized how quiet it was all around me. Usually when you're in nature, you hear birds chirping or the wind blowing through the trees. But it was completely silent here, except for my own breathing. I decided to continue walking down the trail to see if I could find whatever this thing was. So I kept going until the trail ended, and then opened up into a clearing with another trail branching off to the right. I'm pretty sure I'd seen the couple from before going that way. As soon as I took a few steps onto this new trail, I heard something slam on the ground behind me, like a rock being thrown. I turned around immediately and scanned the surroundings, but didn't see anything out of place. No branches were moving or leaves rustling. Nothing was moving. After a few seconds, I decided to keep going and see if whatever it was I had seen before had followed me. I didn't see anything, so I kept walking for about five minutes when I came across a small clump of trees growing tightly next to each other. As I stood there wondering how they had come to grow that way, I noticed something on the ground just beyond one of the trees that looked like a stick, but it was white in color, which was intriguing. So I walked closer to it, and when I got close enough to pick it up, this creature that I can only describe as a monster appeared from behind the tree right next to me. It was tall, at least eight feet, had gray skin, black eyes, and no nose. Nothing that you could call a normal mouth, either just this opening where its face met its neck. It also had long fingers with sharp claws instead of hands. Shockingly, the creature was so startled by me that it let out this screeching sound and ran away. I was too shocked to move for about 20 seconds, but when I snapped out of it, I booked it back to my campsite. The older couple from before were just returning from their hike as I arrived. They asked me if everything was all right because they said it looked like I had seen a ghost. I must have been white as a sheet. I blurted out all that had happened and the couple seemed genuinely concerned for me. I'm not sure if they were concerned at that point because they believed me or because they thought I was having some sort of an episode. The husband offered to sit with me the rest of the night if I wanted him to, but after a while I felt much better and we all relaxed and continued about our respective businesses, just sitting and relaxing at our sites. And then at around 9.30 at night, we both heard the loud noise of something slamming into the trees behind us. It made a noise that even shook the ground, which scared the crap out of everyone. The one dog belonging to the couple started barking in the direction of the noise and wouldn't stop. So the husband got up to see what was going on, and there, behind the trees, was the same thing I had seen earlier. And it started throwing rocks at him and the dog. We could even hear them hitting from where we were. He ran back to his campsite and I watched as the thing chased him back, but it continued running towards the trail that we had been on earlier. I then watched it follow the trail until it reached a bend where it disappeared into the forest. We never saw or heard from it again after that. The husband and wife packed their things instantly though, said goodbye and drove off in their car. They gave me a look like they knew what I was talking about now. I stayed on the rest of the night by myself, but I didn't sleep a wink. I still don't know why or how I even did that. The next morning I packed up my stuff and I left as quickly as possible. Needless to say, I haven't been back to Yosemite since then because that completely ruined the experience for me. And no, this thing was not a Sasquatch or a Bigfoot or whatever people call them. It was something else entirely. 
It almost looked like an alien with its gray skin and black eyes. But whatever this thing was, it wasn't normal at all. I've been camping and hiking all over the country, and I've never experienced anything like this. Whatever it was, it wanted us out of that campground, and it did everything in its power to scare us away. I was investigating a case from a local ranch complaining of dead cattle. If a rancher loses an animal to predation, they're supposed to report it. A big part of my job is trying to minimize the conflict between ranchers and wildlife. I take it pretty seriously. It's a big part of why I got into this line of work. I want to help preserve nature as best I can, but I don't like to see ranchers lose their livestock either. This particular situation was an odd one. The rancher reported several missing cattle as well as several injured ones that he was forced to euthanize. The injuries on the cattle didn't make sense. There were broken legs and head trauma, not something I would expect from a bear, a wolf, or a mountain lion. The cattle would have scratches and sometimes puncture wounds on their sides, but it wasn't severe enough damage to cause death. I took his reports, but I didn't have much in the way of solutions for him. At least, not until I could figure out what the predator was. I told him to call me the next time he found a dead or injured cow in the pasture, because I wanted to look at it for myself. I got there, and just as he had described, there was a cow lying dead in the pasture. The rancher told me three others had gone missing that night, but there were no signs of them. I examined the cow. There was dried blood originating from the nose and the mouth. The cow's skull had been caved in on one side. Three of its four legs were most certainly broken, and there were what looked like claw marks on either side of its back. I thought I might have some answers after seeing the cow myself, but I didn't. The cow hadn't been eaten, and predators that go to that much effort to kill a cow definitely don't leave a meal like this. The rancher and I drove around the fence line, looking for some place a large predator could get in. I will say, wolves and lions can easily get under and over fences, but this didn't look like the work of either. We thought maybe there was a break in the fence, and an aggressive bison had gotten in. That's about the only animal out there that could do damage like that. But the fence was intact. I didn't have much advice for the rancher other than to set up trail cams. It took a couple of months to finally catch something on one of those cams. The rancher showed up to my station with the photos that he got off the trail cam, and things made even less sense than before. There were no signs of a predator. It looked like the cow fell straight out of the sky. That would explain the head trauma and the broken legs, but it didn't explain how the cow got in a situation where it was falling from the sky. All of us in the station were huddled around these photos, trying to make sense of it. One of the ranchers takes a quick look and said he knew what it was. He said, it was a thunderbird. The natives talk about them. They have for years. Most people think they don't exist anymore, but they do. Granted, there aren't many of them left. You'll see them right before a storm or right after. But nobody believed him. Most of us thought it was a joke. After that, somebody claimed it could have been an alien abduction, and everybody laughed except for the rancher. Still, the situation bothered me. I couldn't come up with a logical explanation as to what exactly was happening to this rancher's cattle. I thought about it for a few weeks, and I couldn't come up with one dang thing. I ended up driving out to the rancher's property to talk with him again. Not that I thought I was going to find answers. When I arrived, there was a for sale sign at the end of the driveway. The rancher said he was moving his whole operation. He said the cows weren't safe there, and he didn't feel safe anymore either. I had really hoped that he hadn't latched on to the idea of aliens because I knew of some old farmers who had, and they had turned out to be nutcases. And then he showed me a photo. He said that after that ranger said what he said about the Thunderbird, the farmer looked back at all of his reports of missing or dead cattle. And then he checked the weather records. The incidents with the cows lined up with the thunderstorms. During the next thunderstorm, he drove out to the pasture and he finally saw the creature harming his cows. He showed me the photo. It was hard to make out against the backdrop of the storm but it did look like a giant bird. A bird as big as a bus. It was unbelievable. 
The photo wasn't great quality. I tried to zoom in on its face, but it was difficult to see. It had a reptilian quality to it, though. It almost looked like a cross between an eagle and a dinosaur. I didn't know what to say to him. I didn't have any ideas on how to get rid of this thing or even what exactly it was. The rancher said he didn't want to live anywhere near it. He said he couldn't sleep at night knowing that that thing was out there. I don't blame him. I never saw the bird myself, but I dug into it a bit. It seems there are stories out there, just like the ranchers. Stories of farm animals with blunt trauma and broken legs. It doesn't happen very often, but it happens. I'm assuming the birds were intending to eat the cows, but for whatever reason, they slipped out of their grasp. Anyway, that's the only explanation that I can come up with. As a skeptic, I've always been hesitant to believe in things like aliens and UFOs. But one experience I had on the Appalachian Trail in Virginia completely changed my perspective. It was then that I became a full-blown believer in extraterrestrial life. I was hiking through the Appalachian Trail in Virginia, enjoying the beautiful scenery and fresh air. It was a gorgeous day and I had been hiking for hours just taking in the sights and the sounds of the forest. I was alone and enjoying the solitude, but little did I know that I was about to have an encounter that would change my life forever. I'm an avid hiker, and I had been planning this trip for months. I'd always been fascinated by the Appalachian Trail, and I wanted to experience it firsthand. I was physically fit and well-prepared for the journey, but I had no idea what was in store for me. As I was walking, I felt a strange presence around me. It was as if something was watching me from the shadows. I tried to shake off the feeling and focus on the beautiful scenery, but the feeling persisted. And then I saw something strange in the sky. It was a bright light, moving quickly and erratically. First I thought it was a plane or a helicopter or even a drone, which isn't even allowed. But as it got closer, I realized it was something else entirely. It was a disc-shaped object, hovering in the air, just a few feet above the trees. I was just staring at the object, trying to figure it out. And it was strange, too, because it was completely silent. There was also no wind, but the trees and the bushes around it were rustling as if it was creating a vortex of air. Suddenly, a beam of light shot out from the craft and completely surrounded me. I felt as if my body was being lifted off the ground and pulled into the ship. I couldn't move or scream or anything. Inside the ship, I was surrounded by beings that I could only describe as aliens. They were tall and slender with large heads and big black eyes. They didn't speak, but I could feel their thoughts in my mind. They were studying me brutally probing me. I was terrified. As they continued their examination, I started to feel intense pain. It was like they were cutting into my skin and probing my organs. I felt every bit of it. I tried to scream, but I couldn't even open my mouth. It's a memory and an experience that I will struggle with for the rest of my life. I was beyond scared. I wanted it to stop. I didn't know how, though, how to make it happen, or how much I could take and I was afraid that they, or the pain of it, would kill me. The aliens seemed to be taking samples of my flesh, probably for my DNA, and they were using machines and tools that I couldn't even begin to understand. I didn't know how much longer I could take it. After what felt like hours, they released me, and I found myself back on the trail. I was disoriented, and I had no comprehension of what had just happened. I stumbled through the woods trying to make sense of it, and then when I finally made it back to civilization, I went to the local police station to report what had happened. They were skeptical, to say the least. They told me to get off the trail, go home, and get some rest. I guess they assumed that I was ill-prepared for the trail. I did some research, and I found out that other people had reported similar encounters with aliens. They described the same creatures that had abducted me, and many of their details matched mine. I can't tell you how relieved I was to realize that I wasn't alone and that there was something out there. 
At least that's what I was thinking with these other reports. I started to look deeper into the alien phenomenon, and I found out about a government agency that was investigating these sightings. They'd been keeping tabs on aliens for years, and had supposedly even contacted them. I couldn't believe it. I didn't know what to do with this information, so I basically did nothing. My belief is that we truly don't know what's out there. We're helpless against the real powers that are at play. It was a humbling and terrifying experience. I'll never be the same. In the weeks and months that followed, I continued to research alien phenomenon. I never had another encounter with them, but I always feel that they're out there, watching us, studying us. It's a strange and unsettling feeling, but it fills me with a sense of wonder and awe. Looking back on the encounter, I realize how lucky I was to survive. I had come face to face with something beyond our understanding, something that most people will never see in their entire lives. It was an experience that left me with more questions than answers, though. What else is out there? What else do we not know? Unexplainable things happen all the time. I know that. I'm not naive. You never realize the magnitude of those moments until you're in them, though. I worked search and rescue. I thought I'd seen it all. But then, I saw the beast. I wasn't working at the time. I was scaling a peak on my own. I regularly hiked and climbed to keep myself in shape. I remember the air getting cold and crisp as the sun started to set. The cold fed into my adrenaline somehow, and I was determined to reach the top by dark. The scent of the earth and the pine were the only companions I needed to motivate myself to keep pushing further. This was a peak that I had had my eye on for a while. I wasn't going to turn back before reaching my goal. The howl was my first warning. It sounded far off and strangely muffled. It didn't strike me as a wolf or a coyote, but I couldn't imagine what other sort of animal would make that sound. I stared in the direction that the call had come from, I watched some birds scatter from the trees in the distance, and when the forest got quiet again, I moved on. I was still an hour from my ultimate destination. I had all the gear I needed in my pack to set up camp. With darkness closing in fast, I doubled my pace. Maybe that sense of urgency is the reason I blocked out the ominous nature of the animal's howl. Maybe I was just careless. Either way, I wasn't complaining when my luck turned up. A few trees had been overturned at the summit, creating a perfect clearing. There were no signs that I could recognize of the area being occupied by a bear or a pack of wolves, so I set up camp quickly. I'd have a good view of the stars overhead and an even better view of the sunrise in the morning. Night came and went in painstaking beauty. The ugly thing woke me up an hour before the sun broke the horizon. It started with a loud knocking. I was shaken from my sleep so abruptly that for a moment I thought I was back home. I thought somebody was banging on the door to my apartment. But when I sat upright and opened my eyes, all I could see was the darkness of the tent around me. I knew instantly that something was wrong. And then I called out. Animals in that area didn't knock in that way. But nobody answered. I had a compact shovel close by, so I grabbed it and made my way out of the tent. I knew facing down a predator was out of the question. I just needed to know what I was dealing with. And the shovel gave me enough of a false sense of confidence to head outside. Who's there? I called again, and the knocking stopped. I knew from experience that hikers could be a mischievous bunch. I'd rescued a few that had gotten in over their heads trying to prank a friend or a brother. A rustling brought my attention to the edge of the camp. And the moment that my eyes adjusted to the depth and the darkness, I saw it. I thought at first it was a man. He would have been seven feet tall, but I didn't know how else to rationalize what I was looking at. This beast was standing on two legs. Its eyes caught the faint moonlight. I could distinguish a pair of pronounced canine teeth behind the lips that were curled up into a strange snarl. It was covered from head to toe in hair, thick almost woolly but dark-colored. I opened my mouth, but the words caught in my throat. 
Whatever courage the shovel had given me, it dropped to the bottom of my stomach. I just climbed a mountain, but I'd never felt so small. Like I said, you can't perceive the magnitude until you're in the moment. If I'd felt any heavier, I would have sunk into the earth. And then the beast ran towards me. It sprinted at me with an intensity of an Olympian with a gold medal in reach. I don't know how I found the strength, but I turned to run. I thought for sure that death was right behind me. I'd be the unspecified remains discovered after a supposed bear attack. But to my surprise, the beast didn't follow. It ran into the camp, and I heard him destroy it. I heard the tent being upended and my pack torn open. I heard my belongings spill across the ground with a loud noise. And at the time, I thought all of those sounds spelled doom for me. But as I got further and further away, the sounds got quieter. I was midway down the mountain before I stopped to catch my breath, before I looked up at the sun and accepted that I was alive. But I wasn't free just yet. I still had to get back to my car, but I was alive. I called a few friends the moment that I could. They were veteran climbers, also members of Search and Rescue. A few of them laughed. Others told me to keep the story to myself. I did, not wanting to tarnish my reputation, but I still climbed back to that campsite the following month. I recovered what wasn't destroyed or discarded. I thought that maybe I had proof. There weren't any signs of a bear attack, no claw marks or prints or indentations of a bite on my pack. There were footprints, though. Those I tried to share. I tried to send them to friends who had doubted me, who had tried to keep me quiet. They strongly recommended that I delete the photos, and they warned me not to return to that summit. I can't imagine why. Unless they think that the most dangerous part of that night wasn't the encounter at all. Maybe they know something about that mountain that I don't. What do you believe? I've never heard anyone report anything like this on your show before, so I'm not sure if it's even something you'd be willing to use. But after several years of kicking around the idea of going public with this story, I decided to give your show a shot. When I was a kid, I lived in rural Louisiana with my mom, dad, and two sisters. I was the middle kid. The middle kids tend to be the loners of the pack. I spent a lot of time out stomping around in the wilderness, but because of venomous snakes, alligators, and the like, my parents were constantly telling me that I needed to stick close to the house. Of course, I rarely listened to them, and I would find reason to sneak off as often as possible. Eventually, they gave up on trying to keep me corralled indoors and simply told me to be home by mealtimes to check in. In the summer of 92, I was 12. Being summer, I hadn't seen my friends in weeks because the only time I ever really went out was to go to school. So with school closed and me so far from town, it took some effort to get to hang out with them. My mom always knew this was hard for us kids, so she planned a few slumber parties throughout the summer so that we could get our friends out to the house to hang out and catch up during the long break. One night, she planned one of these get-togethers for me and my friends. My two best friends, Chris and Alex, came out to the house and Mom made pizza. We played Super Nintendo until our thumbs were sore, and then we decided to go outside and explore. Mom and Dad were always especially nervous about me taking friends out into the woods. I guess they figured that I was able to make my own way around and avoid trouble, but it was risky to take somebody else's kid out there and potentially have them hurt or bit or lost or any number of strange things that can occur out in the swamplands of Louisiana. I told my friends we would have to be quiet sneaking out so Mom wouldn't try to stop us. We were able to avoid her and soon we were free to explore the outdoors. I took them down to the swamp and I showed them alligator tracks in the mud, which kind of scared them, so they wanted to head back to the house almost right away. I was regretting showing them the tracks, though, because being outside was my favorite thing, and I was kind of dreading heading back inside just to stare at the TV some more. There wasn't a lot else to do out where we lived, and I felt kind of like a bad host not having better entertainment options for my friends. In fact, I guess I kind of felt like they would treat me like a loser or not want to hang out anymore if I didn't do something to keep them entertained. So that's when I remembered... There's this really cool old abandoned house out in the trees that always struck me as a likely haunted spot. It took a bit of convincing, but my friends did agree to come with me and check it out. 
so we started heading that way. It was a massive house, similar to the plantation-style homes that used to stretch out across the state, but not as big as most of them. It had the wide columns on the front porch and the wraparound balcony up top, though. And even before we got up to it, my friends were already impressed. No, there weren't any roads out there or anything anymore, so it was pretty well hidden, like a secret. As we got close to the house, though, Alex suddenly stopped walking and started to dart back away, screaming, yelling something. Chris and I both asked what was going on, and Alex said, there's something moving up on the balcony. We stood where we were, and we all looked up. Sure enough, something was slithering along the balcony, occasionally showing itself through the gaps in the wood banister. It looked like a huge snake, at least two feet in diameter in the fattest part, and it had to have been about 20 feet long because we could see the tail end of it through the holes on the one side of the porch, and the thicker part of it at the opposite corner, although we had yet to see the head. Now I'm a naturally curious person, so I wanted to see it better. I started creeping up closer to it while the other two yelled at me not to. They seemed almost angry with me that I was advancing on the thing, but I refused to stop. Finally, I found a large stick and I threw it as hard and as high as I could. I did all right because it cleared the banister and hit the thing, startling it. I know that because next it started to slither up and over the banister advancing down the side of the house, and only then did we get a glimpse of how truly horrifying it was. The thing had the long body of a snake, and easily 20 feet in length, like I said. But at the head of this thing, there were shoulders, two arms, and a head, and a face. It looked almost human, but it had yellow glowing eyes, and it was flicking its tongue as it slithered towards us. It reached its hands out like it couldn't wait to grab one of us. Luckily, it wasn't a fast mover. We were able to actually get away from it pretty easily, and we ran straight back to my parents' house. We spent about an hour sitting on the floor of my bedroom, panicking that the thing would follow us home, but we never did see it again. After that, my friends weren't too interested in visiting me out in the swamps, and I can't say I blame them. I didn't do much exploring after that either. I did get pretty good at Nintendo, though. And today, I'm a professional video gamer and award-winning esports champion. Silver Line. I was working as a park ranger in Redwood National Park in Northern California when this happened on a beautiful sunny day in May of 2017. The park was not very busy that day, and there were only about a dozen people at the visitor center when this family came walking in with their young son. They told me that they had just seen this strange creature while walking the Lady Bird Johnson Grove Trail, and they were scared enough that they wanted to report it. I asked them what it was, and the father said he didn't know, but it looked like a big dog or a wolf, and it ran from him faster than he'd ever seen anything move and then disappeared into the trees. I thought... Okay, maybe someone's pet got loose or something. So I made a call out to see if anyone had reported a missing animal of any kind recently. No one had. So I told this man that we'd keep an eye out for it if he wanted to leave his name and number to get any updates. He did, and then left with his family. I watched them get in their car and drive off. I'm not sure where they were headed, but I really didn't expect to have to talk to them again. And then about 10 minutes later, another man came in and said he had just seen a big black bear walking strangely, and he described having seen it in the same area as the first family. I asked him if he was sure that it was a bear because someone else had reported seeing something strange there earlier. He said yes, it looked like a bear, but he said it was weird because it ran on two legs instead of four. So I told him what the first guy had seen and asked him if it was similar to that. He described exactly what the first family had seen except that he said the animal was a bear versus a dog or a wolf. He said the animal was all black with no other colors, no white around the eyes or the muzzle. However, this guy also said it looked like it had been burned or something weird because its fur was singed around the edges. I thanked him for the information and he left. So now I had two reports of something really strange in basically the same area 
and was starting to get a little worried. I decided to head over and check it out myself. I headed out to the Ladybird Johnson Trail and didn't see anything when I first got there. But after wandering around a bit and looking for anything out of place, I heard something in the bushes. I slowly approached, and whatever it was must have heard me coming because it ran out of the bushes and took off into the woods, but not before I got a good look at it. It was this big, black, hairy creature that to me did look like a cross between a dog and a wolf and a bear. It also had singed fur around its face and body, and it was definitely not acting like any animal I had ever seen, because it was running on two legs instead of four. Just like that guy said. I called out to it a few times, but it just kept running until it was out of sight, and I knew instantly that this was the thing that the others had seen. I followed it for a while and then lost sight of it. I couldn't believe what I'd just seen, and I had no idea what to do next. I didn't know if anyone would take seriously my description of the thing, but I did go back to the visitor center and report what I had seen. Needless to say, we closed the area down until we could figure out what was going on. Thank goodness they at least believed me that much, to at least check things out and keep the place safe. Rangers were sent to the area to try and find the creature, but after a full day of searching, they never found anything. We eventually reopened the area to the public, but we were never able to figure out what that thing was that people saw that day. It remains one of the strangest things that has ever happened to me in all my years as a park ranger. While I was growing up, my dad always made sure that my brother and I spent a lot of time outside. He wanted to make sure that we had all the outdoor skills that he said would make us men. The thing is, I've always kind of felt paranoid in the woods. I always thought I needed to hide that from my dad, though. I didn't want to be a sissy and disappoint him. But I did get really good at scouting new trails and outfitting our campsites and all that stuff. It's not that I didn't like it. I just felt vulnerable out there in the wild. Anyway, one year my dad got all excited about exploring the Boundary Waters in northern Minnesota. He then spent a couple of weeks planning it out and finding the perfect campground, and then within a few weeks, we were off. A few days into the trip, it dawned on me that I was actually having a good time. My brother and I made friends with some other kids who were there, and we found this great spot for cliff jumping at one of the lakes. The day after that, we headed out on a boat, and when the three of us were at a portage, we ran into some other campers who said that they had seen two moose swimming across the lake. We were excited to hear that, and we were hoping for a chance to see them. For some reason, I wasn't scared thinking of the moose, even though nowadays I realize how dangerous they can be. So we took a break from paddling and were looking for a spot underneath a grove of trees to take our break. Once we found it, my brother then looked for a ledge where we could jump into the lake. While looking, we kept finding these huge stacks of rocks along the tree line. They weren't your typical little stacks that people usually make. They were made with these super heavy rocks. Some of them were even precariously balanced, and my dad was yelling at us to keep away from them in case they fell over. He even tried to dismantle one of them that was close to the ledge that we wanted to jump off but the stones were way too heavy for him to even move. So we finally found a good spot for jumping and spent an hour there before heading back for dinner by the fire. For some reason, I was starting to get my old paranoid feelings back, even though we had been having a great time. It didn't help that while we were eating, a weasel came running right through the campsite and went into the water. At least we had a good laugh when we realized what it was. But the darker it got that day, the more I found myself wishing I could be home. I eventually got settled into my sleeping bag, but I was having a hard time getting to sleep. I couldn't figure out why I had gone from having fun to feeling like something was out to get me. I laid there until I heard my dad and brother start snoring, and then I felt really alone, knowing that they were asleep. I wished I could just go to sleep without worrying, but I started freaking myself out just by listening to even the simple noises like the leaves rustling. But actually that night, the sounds were different. 
Even over the sound of my dad's snoring, I kept hearing a soft thud over towards the lake. Our tent was probably 200 feet from the water's edge, which didn't feel like a comfortable distance to me. I started wondering if those moose that we had heard about earlier were nearby, but then I didn't know if moose were nocturnal or not. And then I heard this incredibly loud splash. And since we had just heard about the moose that were swimming, I kept telling myself it must just be them jumping into the water. But that didn't sound right either when I thought about it. I realized that it was unlikely that a moose would jump in. It would just walk in the water. And then all of a sudden there was this barrage of splashes. Dozens of splashes of things landing in the lake. Heavy things. The lake sounded almost like it was exploding when they hit. Definitely not moose. And then I started hearing this low howling that kept escalating into a loud whooping noise. I couldn't believe my dad and brother were sleeping through this. I decided I needed to risk a look out of the tent flap, so I unzipped it a tiny bit and I slowly peered outside. When I looked out, I thought I was hallucinating. I could see this creature standing next to the water that looked in the moonlight like it was a giant, hairy man. The howl was definitely coming from whatever that thing was. I was too scared to scream or even move, which is why I didn't wake up my dad or my brother. And then I watched it take one of those incredibly heavy stones, like the ones we had seen earlier, and toss it into the lake like it was nothing. And then the thing lifted its mouth into the air and howled again. This time I snapped out of my incapacitated state and I started shoving my dad to wake him up, whispering that something was wrong. I expected him to know what to do to scare the thing off, but instead, after he looked at it for a few minutes through the flap, he zipped it back up and instructed me to stay completely still and quiet. His reaction freaked me out even more. I'd never seen my dad pause about anything, but he was visibly shaken. We listened for the better part of an hour while that thing raised hell out there, and then eventually we heard the sounds of it running off through the shallow water at the lake's edge. We stayed totally still for another ten minutes or so, and then my dad barely unzipped the tent to look out. It was all quiet. There was no sign of that thing. We then heaved a huge sigh of relief when we realized that we couldn't hear it anymore. My dad looked at me and said, If I didn't know better, I would think we just saw Bigfoot. Well, that was the end of any hope of sleep for me. I still couldn't believe my brother had missed the entire thing. We then all got up at sunrise, and while we loaded everything up, it occurred to me that the spot we had camped in might be its home. And maybe the stacks of rocks might be some type of boundary markers. If so, I have no idea why it didn't roust us out of the tent and do away with us. But I am sure happy it didn't. As a lifelong farmer living in rural Texas, I am no stranger to the occasional predator taking down a chicken or two. But something strange has been happening on my farm lately and it has me really spooked. My livestock has been getting killed in the most gruesome way possible, with huge claw marks and signs of being devoured horrendously. It's like nothing I've ever seen before. This wasn't the work of wolves, bears, or anything like that. I've done lots of research, and I'm highly convinced that this can only be the work of a chupacabra. I live in a remote farm in Texas, surrounded by miles of fields and woods. It's a peaceful life, and I love what I do, but lately something has been killing my livestock, and I don't know how to tackle the problem. It's affecting my livelihood and my sanity, and I need to get to the bottom of it. I've been a farmer for over 20 years, and I've never seen anything like this. I take pride in my work, and I care for my animals, it's been tough to see them attacked and killed in such a violent manner. It all started a few weeks ago when I found one of my cows dead in the field. At first, I thought it was a mountain lion or a coyote, but the wounds were different. They were large and deep, and it looked like something had drained all of the blood from the animal. 
I searched the area for any sign of what could have caused the wounds, and that's when I found the footprints. They were large, with long claws, and they didn't look like any animal print I'd ever seen before. I knew I had to find out what was causing this. Over the next few days, more of my animals were attacked and killed in the same way. I set up traps and cameras, hoping to catch a glimpse of whatever was doing this. And then one night, I saw it. I was sitting in my truck scrolling through social media on my phone when I saw a creature come from the woods. It was about the size of a large dog, but it had spikes on its back and long claws. It attacked one of my goats and it took it down in seconds. I knew then that I was dealing with something far more dangerous than a coyote. I jumped out of the truck, I grabbed my shotgun from the back, and I ran after the animal. As soon as it saw me coming, it took off back into the woods. It was seriously fast, and I wasn't about to go trekking through the dark woods after it. And then the attacks became more frequent and more violent. Whatever this creature was, it seemed to be getting bolder and more aggressive. It wasn't just taking down my livestock anymore. It was now coming closer to my home and my family. I was afraid for our safety and the safety of the livestock, my only income. I started strategically parking my truck near my livestock and pretty much camping out there to watch out for the predator and to take care of it once and for all. One night, I heard some stomping coming towards my livestock, and when I turned my truck's lights on, I saw the creature staring back at me. It was standing on two legs, and it had large yellow eyes and big, awful teeth. I jumped out and went after it, but it escaped into the woods. I knew then that I had to do something before it was too late. I did some research, and that's when I first discovered that the creature I was dealing with could be a chupacabra, a legendary creature from Latin American folklore known for attacking and killing livestock. It was also known for sucking the blood out of animals, and I had never heard of any living creature doing that before. So this had to be what I was dealing with. I reached out to some experts and authorities on the chupacabra hoping to get some answers and advice. They told me that the creature was a nocturnal predator that was known for attacking and killing livestock, and that it had been spotted many times in Texas before. Finally, I felt validated and like I wasn't alone. They also said that the chupacabra was a mysterious and elusive creature, with many theories and legends surrounding it. Some people believe it's a government experiment gone wrong, while others think it's an alien or supernatural creature. Now I was positive that it was a chupacabra that had been attacking my animals, and I had to get serious about this. I set up traps and cameras, and I took extra precautions to keep my family and animals safe. And then, after weeks of waiting and watching, I finally caught the creature on camera. As I watched the footage, I couldn't help but feel a sense of relief and closure. I finally had proof of what had been attacking my farm and I knew what I was up against. But at the same time, I couldn't shake the feeling that there was still so much I didn't know about this thing, or other mysteries of the world. I reported my findings to the experts and authorities hoping to contribute to the understanding of this elusive creature. I also shared my story with others, hoping to raise awareness and caution for those who may encounter this thing, or some other mysterious creature. Looking back on the experience, I realize how little we know about the world and the creatures that inhabit it. The chupacabra may be just a legend to some, but it's also a reminder that there's still so much we have yet to discover and understand. If any of you have any tips on how to catch a chupacabra, that would be appreciated. While I'm glad to have found an explanation for the attacks on my farm, I also feel helpless that I still haven't been able to trap or kill the creature. The day I finally get my hands on the beast is the day my brain will finally be able to relax. This experience that I'm about to share with you happened to me one day about 10 years ago when I was about 16 years old. 
I still live in the same farmhouse here in southwestern Pennsylvania, and I have no plans to ever move away, even though what I'm about to tell you still haunts me to this day. Mostly because I can't figure it out. I was hunting squirrels with my dog that day, and I had a 22 rifle slung over my shoulder. We walked down the hill from our house about 200 yards or so to a large field that's surrounded by woods on three sides. It's an open field with some old dead trees scattered throughout. The woods are very thick and they have lots of laurel in them. There are also several small streams running through along the edge. Well, I had stopped to take a break at one point and was shooting at some old tin cans when all of a sudden my dog stopped running around and started staring intently into the laurel thicket about 50 yards from me. I didn't notice him stop at first, but once I realized I was no longer hearing him running and sniffing around, I turned to see him just pointing at the brush. He looked like that for about five minutes and then started slowly creeping towards where he was looking. He got about halfway there when suddenly he started growling and backing up while staying low to the ground. I was wondering what could be in that laurel that he was reacting so intensely to. I'd never seen him act like that. So I slung my rifle over my shoulder and started walking toward him. As I got closer, he noticed me approaching and he turned and ran back towards me. And when he got close, he jumped up on my leg and started barking furiously at me, almost like in a warning kind of a way. At this point, whatever it was must have reacted to his barking because it let out a loud scream that sounded like a high-pitched screech. It scared the hell out of me because it sounded so much like a human screaming, but it was much louder than any normal human scream. My dog then literally cowered down on the ground next to me and would not move. I stood there for a few minutes trying to figure out what it could be and then I decided that it was probably just a deer or something stuck in the thicket that had screamed when the dog came near it. So I slung my rifle back over my shoulder and started walking towards where the noise came from. When I got about halfway there, it screamed again. So this time it sounded like it was moving away from me or at least facing in the opposite direction. So I decided that this was all just too weird and I decided to leave and get us back to the house as soon as possible. I had a hard time convincing my dog to get up and move, but once I got about 100 feet away, he jumped up and followed me. When I got home, I found my dad in the barn and I told him what had happened. He looked at me and then he sat me down and told me that he had heard a similar type of scream in that same field about 10 years before I was born but that he had basically forgotten about it until I just reminded him right now. He said he had been hunting with his friends and they heard it in the distance while they were sitting around a campfire in the open field. He said it scared them all so badly that they all just got up, put out the fire and left immediately. But nothing ever came of it, just the memory of the crazy loud scream. So the next day my father and I went out with his hunting dog to try and find out what it could have been. We approached the thicket from the other side, but didn't find anything. We walked around the area for about an hour looking for tracks, but there were too many leaves on the ground to see any tracks or anything like that to help identify what I had heard, so we decided to just leave it alone and head back home. Even his hunting dog didn't seem bothered or alerted by anything out there. Meanwhile, my dog wouldn't budge from the house, so I can't compare anything there. Some people think that what we heard was a fox, because they can scream in a way that sounds like a human. But this was much louder, and it sounded more like a person screaming than any fox scream I've ever heard. Plus, it sounded like it was actually moving away from me when it screamed the second time. And no fox could scare my dog into cowering down and acting the way he did. He's been hunting with me since he was just a pup. And he's never acted that way towards anything in the woods or the fields before or even after this incident. I don't know what to think about it all, but I know I will never forget what happened that day. This area is full of strange stories though, and you can talk to any neighbor and get their own version of something strange that's happened in these parts during their lifetime, and sometimes even stories that are older than that. So anyway, I'm not sure if this one's worth posting on your site or not, but if you think it is, then thank you. Thank you for listening to my story. In the mid-2000s, I was attending college at the University of Maryland Eastern Shore. Growing up in Iowa, I had always wanted to find a way to be closer to the ocean. So I loved the location, and I figured I'd get plenty of time to explore, 
but then I always felt so overwhelmed with studying and assignments, and it ended up that I seemed to spend most of my time inside. Anyway, my roommate Amanda and I decided to abandon our schoolwork one weekend and finally go have an adventure. We decided to go to Assateague Island. It's a barrier island and a refuge for a lot of different wildlife. I was most excited to check out the feral ponies that I had heard about. There don't really seem to be many places where you can see wild horses anymore. So we decided to camp even though it was the off-season and would be pretty chilly. At least there were no crowds. So we borrowed a bunch of gear from our hardcore camping friend and we headed out. We stopped at the visitor center and the rangers told us where we would be likely to see the horses. They told us to just make sure we put away all of our food items whenever we were away from the campsite. We showed them the bear-proof cooler we had borrowed and they said that was fine. We set up our camping spot and we went to the recommended trail. And when we were out there, we caught sight of horses off in the distance. They had told us to stay at least 40 feet away from them, but we were able to get a good look. We were happy to get a not too distant view of horses across an inlet, but then we were really excited when the herd stormed through the water and toward the area where we were standing. There must have been three different herds while we were hiking around that morning. We had some binoculars so we could spot them in the distance, and then we were satisfied with our sightings by noon. We took the rest of the day to have a cookout and just relax on the beach. I was ready for bed early and I got in my sleeping bag right after sunset with my book. I must have fallen asleep right away, and the next thing that I knew, I was woken by something howling. Now I'm familiar with coyotes and wolves, but this did not sound like that. It was higher and screechier, and it gave me goosebumps all over, and I could have sworn it was getting closer. I convinced myself it must be one of the island foxes. So I just fell asleep again, but then this horrible growling woke me up again. It was a really low growl and guttural and rumbling. I could hear something rustling outside the tent, and it was probably half an hour before the noises stopped and I could sleep again. The next day, we decided to take the wildlife loop trail. It was maybe three miles long, and it gave good views of the marsh and the forest. We ended up staying out there a long time, exploring, and by the time we decided to head back to camp, we were both pretty tired and it was almost sunset again. We came over the crest of a dune and could see our tent a ways away. It looked like it was fluttering in the wind, more than it should be. I could tell there was some stuff on the ground by the tent, and I remember saying how weird that was. And then as we got closer, we could see that the tent door was hanging unzipped and flapping around. The stuff on the ground was a bunch of our stuff, our sleeping bags, and clothes. I mean, what the heck? We were thinking somebody had robbed us. We knew we hadn't left any food unsecured, and it didn't seem like the work of an animal because the zippers were just pulled down like a person would do. Inside the tent, there were big, muddy prints all over the floor. If I didn't know better, I would have thought they were from a giant dog. Our bags had been opened and all of the contents had been removed and thrown around. All the food that had been securely locked inside the cooler was gone, and everything was covered with sand and mud. We were totally mystified. And then I heard that growl that I had heard in the night before. I was instantly petrified. I can't tell you how primal it sounded. Amanda and I rushed out and we heard it coming towards us then from the trees. We both screamed when we saw this huge werewolf-looking creature. It was obviously eating something, and it looked like a six or seven foot tall wolf, but it had the torso of a man. It had a long snout and sharp fangs, and when it howled, it sounded a lot like a human scream. It was facing sideways to us, so I couldn't really see its eyes, but its back was kind of hunched and it had massive shoulders. It never looked toward us. It seemed to finish what it was eating and then turned away and went into the trees. We were literally shaken from the shock of seeing that thing. We knew we had to leave. We pulled everything out of the tent and shook it off as best as we could. We threw everything in the trunk. We raced out of there and we did stop at the ranger station, but it was after hours and we couldn't see anybody around. We didn't know what to do. We ended up just going home and called them the next day to describe what we had seen. I have no idea if they took us seriously, or if they thought we were just seeing things. In any case, 
If any of your listeners have any idea what the heck was going on there, please write in and let us know. It really messed up our heads, and it started out as a great trip. I'm 40 years old now, single mom, I have three kids. I've always been really close with my first cousin ever since we were little kids growing up. We've always had somewhat of a bond, I guess you could say. I just love him to death. He can be dramatic, but he keeps things exciting. We didn't have it easy as kids, but we had each other. We were only eight months apart, so we've always been pretty close, even through our distance. Recently, I moved my children and myself from New York to Pennsylvania in order for them to be closer to their father. So, instead of them having to commute to see him, we relocated our home base so that the kids could stay put in Pennsylvania. That way, I would commute back to New York for work, for the time being at least. After a couple of years of doing this, it was getting repetitive and old. So one Monday night, I got a call from my cousin. It was different because usually when he calls, he's the one that has a problem and needs to discuss something pertaining to his life. And I listen. But this phone call was different. When I answered the phone, I was busy braiding one of the girl's hair, and I probably said something along the lines of, Hey, what's up? Are you okay? And he said, Yes, I'm actually fine this time. I just wanted to know how you were doing, if you were okay. I said I was fine, just busy trying to get the kids in bed after their baths. It's a school night, and trying to get ready for my next trip to work into New York on Wednesday. I asked him why, what's up? Again, he said, Oh, nothing. Just call me back when you have a minute to chat. It's no big deal. I agreed to do so. I told him I loved him, and I hung up the phone shortly after. That Wednesday, after the kids went to their dad's house, I departed Pennsylvania for New York as usual to go to work for three days while my children were with their father. I had forgotten to call my cousin back and to see what his concerns were. En route traveling through the city... Actually, it was after I had passed the city and I was on the parkways heading toward eastern Long Island. I had this near-death experience, so to speak. Long story short, I had almost gotten into a car accident. And within a matter of three to five seconds prior to the near accident, I saw my life flash before my eyes, and I knew that this was going to be the end. That this was it. I was about to die in this car accident, and my kids were no longer going to have their mother. Somehow, though, by the grace of God and my guardian angels and whatever else was watching over me that night, I had been able to do some stuntman driving car maneuvers that managed to allow me to avoid hitting the car that had just cut me off, and also avoid hitting the other cars that were traveling alongside me in traffic. And after I'd done this crazy stunt move in my old, beat-up GMC Envoy, I realized that I was still driving on the parkway and somehow not dead. I took a long while to shake it off. I drove another mile or so and then had to pull over because it was so overwhelming. There was no way I should have been alive, really, and somehow I was. I grabbed my necklace, which carries my grandfather's Tiffany keychain with his initials engraved on it, and my grandmother's gold cross, and I kissed them relentlessly, giving thanks, and eventually I was able to continue driving on to work, with the rest of the trip going uneventful, so to speak. I was blown away. I was unable to talk about it for days. It was just too astonishing, and I wasn't even really able to comprehend how that happened, or what force had been protecting me, and why I was still alive. I just knew that I was grateful, and there were many definite angels watching over me that evening. So after I finished my three days of work and returned back to Pennsylvania, I was sitting with my children once again, doing something when my phone rang. Again, it was my cousin and I realized that I had never called him back. So I answered the phone, and I said, Hello, I'm so sorry I never called you, and I asked what he wanted to talk about. After he was done making sure I was okay, he continued to tell me about this dream that he had had. Now this dream that he had had was prior to me leaving for my last New York trip, and having had that near-death, close-encounter car accident experience, or whatever you want to call it, and me, nor him, ever having told each other about it. So he described this near accident to me in every detail except that he was in the car with me when it was happening. This was in his dream that he had had the week prior to my last trip north for work. I couldn't believe the words that were coming out of his mouth. He said that in his dream, he and I were driving. 
Somebody pulled out in front of us, and we knew that we were going to smash into the truck, right into the back of it. That we looked at each other and said, oh my gosh. And then we continued to crash into the back of the car, causing all the traffic around us to crash as well. Basically a multi-car pileup, in which we both and many others had died. He had just described my close encounter car accident almost to a T. It was like in his dream he had left his astral body or something and was with me in the car while I was driving. Somehow he had prevented it from happening, maybe? But this was prior to it happening, as if some kind of a warning which made him want to reach out to me to make sure I was okay. Somehow he had this premonition dream about what was going to happen to me, but he was with me during the time and was able to prevent it from happening. Somehow. That's how I read it. I can't really wrap my head around it fully, though. It's so hard to comprehend. But I was mind blown. He had called to check in on me because of a crazy dream that he had had about us getting into a car accident together and dying. And describing the car accident exactly as it happened to me, with the exception of, I survived somehow managing to continue driving down the road unharmed, the car unaffected, and me being alone two to three days prior to it even happening. Now, I've never told anybody about this near-death close encounter to a car accident experience other than him. I still wasn't even able to wrap my head around how I had somehow survived it and the wheels didn't go flying off the car. He had described to me exactly it. I'm still dumbfounded. I always knew we had a bond, but this is on a whole new level. So whatever, I'm beyond grateful that I'm still here with my children. And for whatever reasons, I definitely had some guardian angels that night. Maybe the love and protection of my still living, lucid dreaming with astral projection cousin did it too. The world is way weirder and more mysterious than we know it to be. That's for sure. I count my blessings, and I hope you do too. Thanks, Maggie. It was summer in Oklahoma, and I was about 10, maybe 11. That day, my grandma picked up me and my younger sister from daycare, and we had gone to eat pizza and then go grocery shopping. By this point, it was right after dark, and we were taking the same way home that we did every time. But that night, everything was going to be different. The roads were empty. But that wasn't strange in our county where there weren't a ton of people. I always loved the way the trees lit up when the headlights hit them, and I was watching them out the window as we drove by, trying not to be dizzy as they raced past. We were in Grandma's truck, and so my little sister was in the middle seat, and she was playing around with the radio. Par for the course for a little kid. She got bored easily. But what wasn't normal was when Grandma looked up and started pointing. Of course, this caught my attention. I looked up too, but I couldn't understand why she was freaking out at first. But it didn't take me long to figure it out. Up ahead, above the tree line, we could see three lights. They were just floating there in the sky. And that's when I noticed that my hair started to float up a bit, like it was staticky, and everything around just felt wrong. The trees weren't moving. I heard my grandma gasp, and then she pulled off the road and into this open field next to us. We sat in the truck and we both watched as this thing stayed in one place, just hanging there in the sky. Also, it was creepy quiet. You couldn't hear any noises coming from the thing, like you would if it was a plane or a helicopter, or any animal noises around either. It was as if we were in this silent bubble, watching the thing hover there in one place. There was no movement, no wind, just absolute stillness. I couldn't believe my eyes, and Grandma obviously couldn't either. She had opened her door and stood with one foot on the ground and one still in the truck with her hand gripping the steering wheel. She looked like she was ready to jump back in and slam her door at any second. I remember looking over at her and seeing that her grip was so tight that her knuckles were white. My unshakable Grandma was obviously shaken. Meanwhile, my little sister was excited about the pretty lights we were looking at. She was too young to know that this wasn't normal. Even though it was still warm from the heat of the day, I shivered, and I was covered in goosebumps all over my body. My hair still stood on end, and it all just felt wrong. Everything was telling me that we needed to run, to get out of there. I didn't understand how I knew that we needed to get out of there, but I knew it. 
I was scared and I yelled for Grandma to get in the truck, begging her to get us home. When she finally heard me, she jumped back in and slammed the truck into gear. The tires spun in the grass before we got traction, but once they grabbed, we were racing home. But even as we put distance between us and that thing, that electric feeling didn't go away right away. I spun around and it was still in the same spot, not following us, but it was now spinning. The lights were going around and around, and I could see another light underneath it, like a beam shining down. But aside from spinning, it wasn't moving, it wasn't following us, it wasn't retreating. It just stayed in that one place, spinning faster and faster like a top. I screamed at Grandma to hurry. I wanted her to put as much distance between us and that thing as possible. And then my sister started crying. She was confused because we were obviously scared and she didn't know why. She was only four or five and had never seen two people at once being super afraid. I kept my eyes on the object until we turned off the road and I couldn't see it anymore. Only then did I turn back to the front to try to calm my sister down. I wrapped my arm around her and I asked her to show me what was on the radio stations that she had been bouncing between. Even as I comforted her, our grandma kept mumbling to herself, like under her breath, saying, I've never seen anything like that. What was that? The rest of the ride home was spent with each of us checking the mirrors and looking back over our shoulders. Even though we couldn't see it anymore, we still felt super uneasy and scared. I was personally terrified it would show back up. I didn't know what it was. I thought I might, but Grandma wasn't talking about it right then. We got home and ran inside, sending my dad back to the truck to get the groceries. Even though the truck was in the garage, I didn't want to go back outside. He didn't understand why we were so shaken. We tried to explain that to him, but he brushed us off. I think he first thought we were just messing with him. Until the phone rang. My dad's friend, who worked at the town office, called him and started telling him that there had been numerous reports of sightings of this weird thing hovering in the sky, over near where we lived. We lived in a small town where everybody knows everything, so it was no surprise that the news was traveling fast. But still, an unusual sighting shouldn't be an emergency. I could tell from listening that his friend thought it was funny that people were calling in and just wanted to share it with my dad. But when the call ended, my dad turned to us, and the smiling face he had on while talking to his friend had now changed. He had been going along with his friend and hadn't said anything about what we had seen. But now, he looked at us, and I could tell he believed us. I was so relieved that other people had seen it. I didn't feel as crazy, but even now, all these years later, I don't talk about that night. We always just kept it within our family that we had also seen it. At least, until now that I'm telling you and finally getting it off my chest. But no matter what, that night will be burned into my memory forever. Most especially, I won't forget the way that that energy field felt. That was freaky. I wish we could have gotten an answer, any answer. But just knowing that other people saw it too... It was 1988, and there was a scary story going around at my college about a dark figure that had been spotted hanging out on the campus roofs and in the bell tower. Some versions of the tale said that it was a demon. Others claimed it was the ghost of a student who had died years ago on school grounds. No one really knew the origin, but the stories went back for years. The first ever record of it was in 1963. That sighting even managed to make it to the local paper. There wasn't much of a story, though. The article just said that there had been reports of a mysterious black figure hanging around the rooftops at the school. The descriptions of the figure ranged from a translucent ghost to an owl-man hybrid, but there wasn't much to go on. These days, it was a running gag around campus. People would dress up as the rooftop ghost for Halloween but nobody actually believed it was ever anything to worry about. I lived in a house with three other roommates that year, and we were directly across the street from the campus library. One night I was walking home late from work, from my job at the gas station on the corner of Main Street. The walk back to my house was maybe only five minutes, and there were lampposts all along the way. I had walked home from there dozens of times after dark, and I never once felt unsafe but this time was different. 
I don't know exactly what it was, but I felt like someone was following me. You know that feeling you get at the bottom of your stomach when you know something bad is coming? Well, that's what I felt. I couldn't explain it. The street lights were all lit. I looked around for strange cars parked along the roadway, but I didn't see anything out of the ordinary. But I just couldn't shake that feeling that someone was watching me. I thought for sure I was about to get mugged, but right then something told me that I should look up. I don't know where the thought came from. Maybe it was from somewhere deep in my brain that recognized I was in danger. I looked up, first at the lamp posts above my head, but I didn't see anything there. And then out of the corner of my eye, I saw a red light shining from the library. I turned to face it straight on, and I noticed that there wasn't one red light, but two. And then it took me a moment to realize that those two red lights were eyes. I could see the silhouette of a creature against the lights coming from the hall behind the library. The creature was standing on top of the roof, almost hunched over. It was definitely the shape of a human or something similar in form, but its arms were big, black wings. Normally I would see something like that and assume it was a prank set up by some of the other students. It wouldn't be too hard to get a costume and crawl on the roof, but I knew in the pit of my stomach that this was no prank. There was something very real staring at me from the roof of the library, and that thing felt evil. The creature was staring right at me. It had to be me. There wasn't anybody else around. I took a quick look around to see if I was in fact alone out there, and it looked like I was. But when I turned back to look at the creature, it was gone. I searched for it. I didn't like not knowing where it was. That was somehow worse than when it was fixated on me from across the street. If I could see it, I could hopefully avoid it. I was now about a hundred yards from my house and I started walking fast. It was the most terrifying walk of my life. I didn't want to run in case it caused the creature to chase me. But then I got that feeling again that feeling that I should be looking up. I scanned the area as I was walking, but did not see anything. Not at first. But I kept looking towards a cluster of trees. They were still on the opposite side of the road, but much closer to me than the library. I knew it was in those trees. I couldn't see it, but I knew it. I knew it was there. I don't know if humans have some sixth sense that alerts them to danger, but I knew. I didn't take my eyes off the trees, and then I saw it. It opened its eyes, but I couldn't see the creature in the shadows of the trees, just those eyes. It was still about 50 yards away from my house, but I knew it could get to me before I got there, if it wanted. I tried my best to seem as calm as possible, and I just kept walking. I thought I saw the creature moving in the trees, but I couldn't be sure. It would hide its eyes from me for a moment, and then they would suddenly reappear. And then the front door of my house flew open. It was one of my roommates screaming at me to run. I was hesitant to take my eyes off the trees, but I knew I had to make a break for it. I made it to the house, and my roommate slammed the door behind us. My roommate had seen the creature too, so I knew I wasn't going crazy. But here is the really strange part, as if things haven't been strange enough till now. My roommate said that he just had this weird feeling to get up from the couch and look outside. And right when he did, he saw me walking down the sidewalk. And then he too had the urge to look up. And that's when he saw that creature fixated on me. And he knew he needed to get me inside. Thank goodness for our sixth sense, or whatever you want to call it. I just know that whatever sense it was, it saved my life that day. Ever since my wife introduced me to your channel a few months ago, I've been hooked. I'm a truck driver and your stories have kept me company through the long nights and have helped me stay focused on the road. As a skeptic, I've always been hesitant to believe in things like ghosts, aliens, and other paranormal phenomena. But one experience I had on the road in West Virginia many years ago completely changed my perspective. It was then that I became a full-blown believer. I was driving probably about two in the morning. The road was quiet and there wasn't much traffic. I was just trying to focus on the road and stay awake. 
All in all, it was a routine night of drinking coffee, listening to tunes, and driving. I'm a long-haul truck driver, and I had been driving for three days straight. I was exhausted, but I had a deadline, and I had to keep driving through. I was carrying a shipment of goods to a small town on the other side of the state, and I was already behind schedule. It's just part of the job, you know, but it's not an easy gig. As I was driving down the road, I noticed something moving in the distance. At first, I thought it was a bear, but as I got closer, I realized it was something else entirely. It was a huge beast, standing on two legs and covered in fur. It was unbelievably tall and staring right at me. It had long, matted fur, sharp teeth, glowing yellow eyes, and muscles bulging under its fur. I slowed down my truck to take a closer look. The creature didn't seem scared of me at all, and it just stood there, staring. It freaked me out, and I just kept staring back at it. It was beyond anything I thought I would ever see in my entire life. I then started to lay off the brakes to continue on, but the creature continued to follow me. It was now running alongside the truck, keeping up with me easily. I sped up, but it just kept pace. It was intense. The thing clearly did not like me or my truck at all. This thing was focused on me. It wasn't stopping. To be honest, I was a grown man feeling helpless in this situation. I wasn't sure how I was going to get out of it, and I didn't know who to turn to. And then the creature started to get more aggressive, and it started to bang on the side of my truck. I could see its eyes glowing in the dark, and it was clear that it was not going to let me go without a fight. I was starting to panic, and I was starting to think about my family back home. I really didn't want to die out there, alone and scared. The creature started then to scratch at my truck's windows, trying to break through. I could hear its claws scraping against the glass, and I knew that I was in danger. I tried to steer the truck away and increase my speed, but it just kept coming. This thing was relentless. And then after what felt like an eternity of driving and evading this creature, I finally found a way to lose it. I quickly pulled out my cell phone, dialed 911. The call went through and I explained what happened to the dispatcher. She sounded just as confused as I did when I was telling her what happened, but she told me to sit tight and that help was on the way. What was bizarre was that police never showed up. Well, at least not police in uniform. A cop car arrived, but out of it came these men in suits who ordered me out of the truck and took down my report. They took pictures of the damage to the truck and told me that there were similar reports of encounters in the area. I was freaked out. They told me that it's not unusual for one of these things to become aggressive like this. They also warned me that it would be in my best interest to not disclose anything about what I saw to anyone, and they pretty much forced me to sign a form saying the same. When they left, I was relieved that everything was over, but as they drove away, my mind started racing on what was being covered up and how much control these people have over the information we receive. With the creature and the men in suits gone, I was finally able to continue along. Now I'm still shaken up by the encounter at this point, but I know I need to keep going. I did make my delivery, and I headed to a motel to pass out, but I could not shake the feeling that something strange was going on. As I finally drove away from the area the next day, I couldn't help but wonder what other secrets the world is hiding. There's so many things we don't know, so many mysteries waiting to be uncovered. As I'm sure you will agree, I don't ever want to encounter another creature like that again. But part of me is also intrigued by the unknown. In the days and the weeks that followed, I try to put the experience behind me. But I couldn't shake the feeling that there's more to the story than what I was told. I did some research and I tried to uncover more information. But all I found were rumors and speculation. Looking back on the encounter, I realize how lucky I was to have survived. I also sort of feel like I've been let in on a secret. Like I've seen something that most people never will. But even all these years later, 
I'm worried about who will come after me for spilling the beans. As I think about the encounter, I realize that there's so much we don't know about the world. There are creatures out there that are barely seen, and secrets that I think the government keeps from us. It's a scary thought, and I can't help but wonder what else is waiting to be discovered. I've always been afraid that if I talked about my gift, people would shy away from me and label me as that weird chick who sees things. But seeing how many people on your channel have come forward with their own stories, I'm finally ready to share mine. Since I was a small child, certain places will trigger me, and I will see things that happened in the past. I'm not really sure if this could be called seeing ghosts. I've always felt like it was some type of residual energy, stamped on a certain place where there had once been high emotion or tragedy. I never was able to interact with anything I've seen, or felt like they saw me, until a recent visit to my co-worker's house. When I was a little kid, I would tell my mom or my friends, and even one time my teacher when I saw something that didn't fit in, like a person drifting through the room. You can always tell the entities are different because they don't have the same type of solid appearance that real people do. But I found out really quick that hearing about it just scared people, or made them mad at me, or made them laugh at me, all of which taught me to keep my mouth shut at a very early age. Now I'm 28 and that lesson has been learned long ago. I always just ignore the entities when I see them now. I've never had any reason to believe that these things could see me until one day I went to my friend Kara's house for a girls' night of Netflix. I've known Kara, or more accurately known of her, since junior high school. We didn't really run with the same crowd, but now that we both work for the same company, we've become friends. Her mom and dad died two years ago, killed by a drunk driver while they were coming home from a Christmas party. It was horrible. I felt so bad for her. I know she and her dad had a lot of problems in the past. Off and on, they would stop speaking to each other, though we weren't close enough for me to ask her why. She said she was really close to her mom, and she only had one sibling, an older brother who ran away from home when he was 17. I don't remember him at all. Kara said he had never been back in touch. So when her parents died, at first she talked about selling the house. She said it had a lot of bad memories for her. Her dad had had a temper, and as soon as she graduated, she had gotten out of there, got her own apartment. But the economy being what it was, about eight months ago, she decided to give up her apartment and move back to her childhood home. When I arrived at Kara's house, I was impressed. It was huge. It was two stories and there was this grand staircase curving down with a mahogany banister. Beautiful. I couldn't help but admire it as I followed her upstairs. She had turned one of her bedrooms into a cozy little den because she said the downstairs parlor seemed too formal. So we ordered a pizza, browsed through Netflix, finding a movie we both liked. It was fun for a while just hanging out and drinking wine while we waited for our food. But after about 15 minutes, I started to get that familiar, prickling feeling on my skin. Usually that happened right before one of my visions would start. I tried to just ignore it, but I kept feeling like somebody else was there, watching us, even though nobody popped into my line of sight. Then the doorbell rang. Kara just excused herself to go use the bathroom. I knew it had to be the pizza guy, and I was happy to pay for it since she was hosting. So I went down the stairs, paid the pizza guy, and turned back around to come back up. What I saw was a young man standing at the top of the staircase. I knew right away it was one of my visions, because he didn't look quite solid. The difference was, this time he was looking right at me, like he could see me, and that's never happened before. He looked really rough with darkness on his face that I thought might be bruises on a real person, and one arm was crooked like it was broken. I was pretty startled because he'd locked eyes with me. I was hesitant to walk up the stairs towards him, 
a little bit afraid, even though I had seen these things my whole life. But this was different. He was watching me. I just stood there with my heart pounding, waiting for him to drift away, like they always do. But something else happened instead. As I stood there, a man came up behind him, waving his hands like he was angry. The guy turned around and you could tell that they were arguing, even though I couldn't hear anything. It was like watching a movie on a bad TV with the sound turned down. Kind of hard to tell what was going on. But suddenly, the older man shoved the younger guy square in the chest. The boy flailed his arms, but he couldn't keep his balance. And I gasped in horror as he tumbled down the stairs, bouncing his head on several steps along the way. He then rolled to a stop, right at my feet, and vanished. My knees were wobbly, my chest felt tight. I felt like I was having a panic attack. I had never witnessed anything so violent before. I heard a voice ask if I was okay, and I looked up. There was Kara standing at the top of the steps. The older guy's spirit was gone now, too. And then it hit me all at once. The truth. I don't have any proof, but I just felt this certainty come out of nowhere and lodge in my heart. I knew that I had just witnessed Kara's father pushing her older brother down the stairs, causing his death. He didn't run away. He was killed. I don't know how I know that, but I just do. That was just too much for me to handle. I just told Kara that I was suddenly feeling sick. I went and got my jacket, and I left. I wasn't able to look her in the eye. I've had some time to think about it, but I still don't know what to do. I have no proof of anything. If this crime really happened, it was almost two decades ago. Sixteen years, anyway. I feel like Kara's brother was trying to catch my eye on purpose, so justice will be done. But how can justice be done if the man who killed him is already dead? Besides which, no one would ever believe me, and Kara would hate me. What do you think I should do? I welcome any advice from any of you. All I ask of anyone is, please be respectful. If you don't have anything constructive to say, just don't comment. I'm having enough of a hard time with this without people calling me crazy. Thank you, and stay safe.